This next poem, uh, I, I think a lot about form, uh, but I'm also well aware that many in this particular generation, and even some for the last, uh, for the 20th century, have been uh, less uh, enamored with very strict forms. And yet I've al always found the sonnet to be, as, as some describe it, sort of that puzzle to master, that form that, that sort of dares you to uh, get it right. And so in this case, this is a sonnet, it's an Elizabethan sonnet. It, it follows the, um, the number of, uh, or the meter, it follows the rhyme pattern. And uh, the, the first line, you know, where do lines come from? Uh, I don't always know. Probably most of the time I don't know. But this one, at about 4.30 in the morning, just started to enter into my brain and, and I couldn't get it out. And so I sat down a little bit later than 4.30 in the morning and wrote it down and it sort of propelled me into the rest of the poem. Um, it's called Evening's Walk. And, and I, I would mention this is very specifically a poem inspired by my uh, weeks uh, in Maine, which I, I generally do during the summer. Upon Bar Island, there's a field I know, a small pasture where the lupine grow. Late now in July, one purple flowers, reminding me of summer's passing hours. Below, the cobbled path rises at low tide, as the rolling, heaving waters subside. This hidden passage for us to wander, waving pines whisper prayers to ponder. In the harbor returned as evening pales, the four-masted Mary Todd lowers her sails. A pair of gulls sing even song for bread, while wood ducks paddle their wings overhead. Blazing and burning, the sun sinking west, thoughts of you, my friend, the moon bringing rest. It was curious to me, uh, weeks after I'd finished the first version of this poem, and I'd continued to sort of pick away at it and play with certain lines and patterns, um, I happened to be resting on my couch, and um, we don't have a television in our living room, but we do have our computer, it was the one that some of our children use, and um, some of the pictures from the summer were sort of running through, and as I sat there, it was almost as if the poem and picture was being replayed for me. I, I hadn't even taken all of the pictures. Some of them, I think, were from my wife. Others were um, maybe from my children, and I think I had taken one or two. But I, I, I was almost reliving this poem uh, through this picture. And in fact, the one line that, that troubled me was this blazing and burning, the sun sinking west, because I thought, well, does the sun really blaze and burn in Maine? I, I don't know that it does. I, I saw the photograph, and I thought, Yes, it does. It, it definitely does. <laughs> Maybe only in uh, late June, but uh, there it was. And, and I thought, yes, th that's what I want to say. Uh, the next poem takes a little uh, sidestep. Um, if Maine is a place that I escape to and I enjoy, um, in part because I'm able to get away from the, the day to day, my garden place that I escape to when I'm at home. Now, that doesn't always mean that I'm alone. Uh, sometimes my dog comes and finds me, other times my children or my wife, uh, you know, so it's a busy place sometimes. But there are other times where it's rather quiet, sometimes early in the morning if I have an opportunity to get out there and just do a little weeding or something or, or just tending to it. Um, it is a place of solace, but it's also a very vibrant and, and lively place, as hopefully a good garden would be. Um, but this next poem is called Cotan's Prayer, and it's inspired by Juan Sanchez Cotan's painting, painting Quince, Cabbage, Melon, and Cucumber. This was actually one that appeared in the fine print a couple of years ago. And uh, it is what's called an emphrastic poem in that it's inspired very directly by a painting. Um, but again, I, the I and inspire here it can go a lot of different directions. But again, that idea of fruitfulness and vitality and, and um, life, even in something that is ironically a still life, as if there really wasn't any in that moment. A quarter note quince, a whole note cabbage, a less than whole melon, and a cucumber. These notes suspended on an airy staff fall to the windowsill silently. A set piece, still life, caught in the window of another master who joins the choir of artists casting shadows with seeds leaves, stripes, and slices. More like five loaves and two fish than a banquet.
casks of water rather than flowing wine, a woman at a well instead of men gathered at temple, and a lone mustard seed, no mountain. String for a vine, props for a painting, a prayer in four notes offered for contemplation of things natural yet divine, whispered at the dawn of a blossoming morn. Therein lies also um, um, at least an expression of my sensibility about the presence of, if you will, God or things spiritual in, in the very dirty, rooty kinds of things that I find in my garden. Another poem that I, I think may have also appeared in the fine print a couple of years ago is called Carp Lessons. Um, carp are these uh, sort of striking fish, usually in ponds, apart from anything else. Um, and so a kind of still life that's not quite so still. <clears throat> Flame-like carp, all burnished red, dart and glide through greening lilies in the safety of a pool in Balboa Park. Fishing poles disallowed, yet I might have picked them out with my hand. Instead, I watched them, no less than five feet from my grasp, laugh at me. No, not really laugh, rather ignore me while they sucked and pinched morsels from the lily pads. And I stood silently, hands in my pockets, and a smile forming on my lips. <laughs>